Welcome to a very special webinar today, a conversation with Canada's 21st Prime Minister, a true visionary, the Right Honourable Paul Martin. My name is Andrew Cardozo and I'm President of the Pearson Centre. I want to start by recognizing that the Pearson Centre is headquartered on the traditional lands of the Algonquin Anishinaabe peoples, and we welcome our speakers and audience from across Turtle Island. As you may know, the Pearson Centre is was established nine years ago, and in fact, today is our ninth anniversary. We're a leading progressive think tank that addresses the challenges, the challenging economic, social, and international issues facing Canada. And we like to say, we bring people and ideas together. A special thank you to all our donors and sponsors, many of whom have joined us today. And a special thank you to our sustaining sponsors, who are Canada's Building Trades Unions, the International Association of Firefighters, and Amapsio, Ontario's professional employees. You all make important, the important work of the Pearson Centre possible. Just briefly on the format, following a discussion for about 40 minutes, Mr. Martin will take questions from you, the audience. So please use the question box on your screen and send in your questions and we'll get to as many as we can. The session will end at 1 p.m. Eastern time. Now, to get things rolling, I want to tell you that there is a long and important connection between the Pearson and Martin families. So we thought it would be most appropriate for Mika Buckley Pearson to introduce Mr. Martin. Mika is a regular participant in the work of the Pearson Center. She's a global infrastructure advisor at Deloitte Canada. And importantly for today, she's the great granddaughter of Lester B. Pearson. Over to you, Mika. Thank you so much, Andrew, and hello, everybody. I'd first like to acknowledge that today I'm joining from Treaty 13, the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Haudenosaunee, and the Huron-Wendat people. I'm grateful to share these lands with their owners, past, present, and future. It's really an honor to have the opportunity to introduce the Right Honorable Paul Martin, Canada's 21st Prime Minister, as Andrew said, and a member of Parliament of 20 years. It's a bit of a tough order to do this in under a minute. I think we all know if I described all of his achievements and contributions, we'd be here all afternoon. And you're not here to, to listen to me. We all want to hear from the man himself. So I'll keep this short. Paul Martin Sr. was Secretary of State for External Affairs in Lester Pearson's government. And while the two men worked together over many years and were known to have their disagreements, they also shared a very fierce commitment to multilateralism and expanding Canada's leadership and impact on global issues. Mr. Martin shares this commitment too. His dedication to collaboration for our collective benefit has been repeatedly demonstrated on both the domestic and international stage, including advancing national childcare policies and reconciliation with Indigenous peoples, as well as establishing the G20 and forging closer relationships with our global partners. Today, Mr. Martin will share his perspectives on navigating our most pressing challenges. And this will happen in conversation with Brian Gallant, 33rd Premier of New Brunswick, advisory board member of the Pearson Centre and CEO of the Canadian Centre for the Purpose of the Corporation. Brian, over to you. Merci beaucoup, Mika. Thank you so much for that uh, wonderful introduction and, and for being a part of today it really adds something pretty special so thank you for that andrew thank you for all the work that you've done and thank you for opening this thing up et bien sûr merci beaucoup monsieur martin thank you so much mr martin for joining us i hope i can speak on behalf of everybody listening in and watching that we're all ecstatic uh, to have you here and we're very excited to hear your thoughts on on this very important and complex topic uh, let's start off, Mr. Martin, if it's okay with, with this. It is the ninth anniversary of the Pearson Center. Uh, as Amika uh, listed off there, pro the, the, the Martins and the Pearsons go way back to say the least. Prime Minister Lester B. Pearson is one of your predecessors, of course. And moreover, your father was a senior minister in his cabinet. Uh, so on this week where we uh, celebrate that anniversary, uh, I, I'd love to give you the opportunity to maybe share some thoughts on the former prime minister and, and, and that relationship between your father and him and even your two families. Well, thank you very much, Brian. And, um, and thank you, uh, Andrew, for your, uh, your comments before. Um, more than anybody, 
um, Miga, it was so it is so good to meet you, um, and and to thank you. You're absolutely right. What Brian has said. Um, and what Andrew has said and what Mika has pointed out is that my father um, and Mr. Pearson were very close friends. They first met at the University of Toronto. Uh, Mr. Pearson was older. Um, my dad would be very glad to point that out. Uh, they're both looking up there. Um, um, but they were very, very close friends. It was close friends that were made in university that continued into government when my dad was the minister. Uh, of health, and Mr. Pearson was uh, uh, was the Minister of Foreign Affairs, um, and continued on. Obviously, when Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Pearson became Prime Minister, let me just simply say that Lester Pearson was one of Canada's great Prime Ministers, um, and it's as simple as that. Uh, his perspective on the world, the the, uh, the what he brought. To the, to the international debate and how he positioned Canada is something that those of us who have come after have benefited enormously from. Uh, I would uh, also point out and, and uh, that I've told us, uh, some other uh, others that occasionally when my dad and Mr. Pearson were both cabinet ministers and they were old friends, Mr. Mr. Pearson would come over to our house and my, he and my dad would sit down and basically solve all of the problems that they had to, to do. I was 10 years old and I was asked to sit in on those meetings. The reason for this is that my dad was not as knowledgeable about hockey as he would have liked. I was 10 years old and very knowledgeable about hockey and Mr. Pearson said well look at I want I've talked to you Paul he said this to my father I've talked to you about these other issues but I want somebody to talk to you about hockey and there you are 10 years old I would be sitting on the floor um, li listening and then I would my main job was to make if there had been a game the night before to, to fill Mr. Pearson in on what happened and um, so make a your great grandfather uh, was a Canadian of the greatest issue. The issues that he dealt with as minister and as prime minister were the issues that we had to deal with. And in the kind of world that we're going into now, an interconnected world, we have got so much to deal with, but countries have got to understand their wider, their, 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 their wider project. One of, the, one of the first examples any prime minister should follow in this country is Lester Pearson. Thank you, Mr. Martin. What an incredible opportunity for a 10 year old to, to sit at the, the table with the Minister of Foreign Affairs, the Minister of Health, and I suppose you were the Minister of Hockey Insight. So uh, an incredible opportunity, I'm sure, for you and, and played a role, I have no doubt, in forming some of your thoughts and opinions on things that you would later on work uh, extremely hard on. One thing that we've all spoken about, uh, uh, in, well, everybody that spoke before you and I have uh, mentioned is is uh, is Indigenous lands, which brings us to a topic that I know is near and dear to your heart, something yeah. that you work very hard as, as Prime Minister on, uh, which is Indigenous reconciliation, and something that I know in, in your post-political life uh, through your family foundation, the Martin Family Initiative, you've been doing quite a bit to try to advance Indigenous reconciliation. Uh, so if, if you don't mind, maybe share with the with the audience a little bit about what the Martin Family Initiative is doing to advance this incredibly important uh, topic and and uh, collective project. Well, thank thank you, Brian. Um, and I should have mentioned that I'm on unceded territory uh, at the present time. But you asked the question, um, why <clears throat> why is this something that I have so, so engaged in? Um, as you may know, the first issue I dealt with as Prime Minister was the Kelowna Accord, which I think it, uh, is now in the process of being filled. But I, unfortunately, there's a bit of a, a bit of a time lag there. The, the answer, though, why am I so involved? It's because Indigenous reconciliation um, is simply um, the most important moral and e economic issues that we face as a country. Um, and you ask about our programs, um, 
the I would like to describe some of our programs to you at, at this point now. Please, yes, yeah. The we have three main programs. One of them is um, our literacy course. If you can't read or write uh, by the um, by the end of grade three, your chances of succeeding in in the in the later elementary years when you've gone from learning to read and write to the to comprehension are, are slight and so that what what we have what we done is brought in a literacy project whereby we have it, it, it teaching literacy is not an easy thing and so what we did is we brought in a literacy project with the experts and then we have now made our and we made ourselves available to a great number of indigenous elementary schools throughout the country this is also something that has played during the whole COVID issue. The COVID issue has been just terrible for any Indigenous school, in fact, for any school period. And as a result of this, we have um, we have really worked. We have really worked with them. One of the things I'm going to do at the end of this question, I've talked about my son going to meetings. My youngest son is in the next room talking to somebody on the phone very loudly <laughs> and i am going to go and just stop him in a minute but i i, I want to say that our first pro that's our first program um our second program is what we call the early years program cindy blackstock who was one of the leading advocates of an indigenous issues has pointed out that one of the problems so many indigenous adults have is the fact that at a later year they have to make up for the fact that they had a very tough childhood and so what we have did, what we did in that issue is we went in, when we first went into a, a, a community uh, in, Al in Alberta, um, we sat down with the mothers in, in this community and said, look, there has to be something that can be done to be able to deal with this, to give children a better, uh, a better, um, a better beginning and they, these mothers agreed we brought in a number of experts largely indigenous and we put together what we call the early years program which is home visitors who are women who have successfully raised their children who will then work with young mothers in order to, to, to help the young mothers do what they have to do we're not talking they don't raise the young mother's children what they do is a training program that will enable the young mothers to basically emulate what they do and you know it is a, i've talked to my wife i've talked to a lot of women it really is a, it's a process that most women go through most you're not born to know everything to be a mother you learn from somebody who has been through the process and this our this program is a huge success this early this early years program uh, we're now in we're in the one community we did in Alberta. Three other communities in Alberta asked to join the program. They're in the program. Not long thereafter, the territory, the Yukon, called and said we want the whole program for the for the Yukon. We're now in Nunavut. We're in no, uh, in Nova Scotia, and we hope very much, Brian, given your background, that we're going to come into New Brunswick uh, uh, very soon. So that's our second program. Which is our literacy? Which our liter is our literacy program, teaching reading and writing, and then it, it's the early years program, and then the third is our business program. And I'm going to take a bit a bit longer, but let me just tell you about this about the business program. Um, it's there is no doubt that poverty is an issue on reserve. It's an issue. Uh, that has to, that that has to be dealt with, and there is also no doubt that that economic inequality is a problem in Canada and what has to happen is that indigenous Canada has to be given an opportunity to basically play their full economic role and this is now happening some of you may know that Clearwater uh, Seafoods the largest seafood company in Canada has now but has now been taken over uh, in a very attractive deal um, by a, a number of the Mi'kmaq nations, as as an example. At the same time, um, wind farms, the 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 Innu in Quebec, are now building one of the going to be one of the largest in wind farms in Canada, which is going to be really important. And so, what you're seeing is that the First Nations, the Indigenous people, the Inuit, the Métis, are now really beginning to move in. However, 
it, this is fine with all of these people with experience, but if they are not followed by the next generation, we, we're going to lose all of this. And what is really important to those, the people who are going to make this revolution work are today in grade school, primary school, and they're in high school. And, and what, that, as a result of that, we brought, in, we brought in a high school program, which is now in some 40 schools. Um, uh, across the country, although it should be in double that number. And we have also brought in an elementary school, grade seven and eight, for the on reserve, um, uh, on reserve grade schools, because most of the high schools where the young indigenous people go to are provincial high schools. Mm. So we're in 40 provincial high schools. And I can tell you, I really believe that as this program takes, co takes, takes form, as it is now, um, there's going to be a huge change and that Indigenous Canada is going to play the economic role that it is entitled to and that I know it will succeed at. Well, first off, uh, great points with regards to Indigenous reconciliation. Uh, second off, thank you so much as, as, a, as a Canadian for the programs that you and your family are, are delivering on to try to help advance Indigenous reconciliation. And third, it's interesting, I'm sure, for everybody that's tuning in to see that even former prime ministers have to deal with working in a pandemic uh, mode with other people using <laughs> rooms next to you and and trying to get their stuff done too. So I, I uh, lots of interesting things in that uh, in that uh, segment for sure. So why why don't we go on, Mr. Martin, to global affairs? Uh, as I'm sure a lot of people tuning in are, are very keen to hear your thoughts. Uh, and I'll, obviously, we're clearly living through a period of of sort of global turmoil with with a lot of challenges, some would say opportunities as well. Uh, major global issues are facing us like the pandemic, uh, climate change, inequalities and inequities, and all at the time when it really does seem that global institutions are struggling with sort of the geopolitical tensions and uh, that are on the rise and, and trying to deliver on their mandates given sort of the environment. So that's why I'm sure Andrew and, and the team at the Pearson Center uh, dubbed this uh, the, the subject to be navigating through a difficult world. So on that note, um, we, we'd really like to hear your thoughts on multilateralism, the, the future of multilateralism, uh, wh where you see it today and where you see it going. Well, there's no doubt about the importance of multilateralism. Um, <clears throat> history, uh, the history, history of the world has been wars between countries. Um, and uh, that doesn't mean, unfortunately, that those days are not ended those of us, all of us following what's going on in ukraine in ukraine understand that these tensions occur and that they will probably be with us for forever but we have now we now as we look um at the um the massive consequence flowing uh, from the pandemic the massive consequence flowing from um the uh, climate change, it is very clear that in addition to the wars between countries, what is becoming more serious is the wars against humanity. And those wars, um, as with the two examples that I have given, are beyond the capacity of any single country, no matter how powerful, to deal with. And as a result, what we have to do is put together the capacity for the world to work together to defeat the powers such as climate change um, uh, or pandemics that would that w want to essentially take humanity on. Um, and I, I, I believe that the best way to do that is through the G20. The G20 essentially represents the majority of the global economy, the majority of global emissions, unfortunately, but it is most of the countries that are capable. It is the, the superpowers economically, it is the regional powers, and it, these countries that can come and basically lay down the foundation that will enable the world to anticipate pandemics, to deal with climate change and any other of the, in, in these massive uh, 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 multiple issues that, that face us. And I, I, so that's why I believe the G20 was so important. The G20 was created by the finance ministers. It is now a major body to dealing with these kinds of things. And I think that it's got to be supported and we've got to look to it to do it's, what it's doing. 
interestingly, I think a lot of people don't recognize the the leadership role that Canada played, and more specifically, the leadership role that you played in the creation of the of the G of the G20. So, to your point, obviously, multilateralism will be crucial to tackle these global challenges. The G20 is an institution that certainly, at least on paper, is well set up to be able to help us coordinate our efforts. So, so just so everybody that is listening can maybe get a sense of of how this came to be and and understanding the history of the G20 will help us understand its future. W would you share a little bit about how it got created in the first place? What what role did Canada, and more specifically even yourself, uh, what, what role was played to be able to create this institution? Well, um, not long after uh, I became a G7, G8 finance minister, um, I think actually it was probably the second meeting. Um, I raised the issue of the G20 on the grounds that listen, this is these are eight powerful countries, but this is not the world, and we've got to we've got to be expand. We've got to we we have, we should really create a new organization that brings in not just the superpowers, but brings in the regional powers and brings in the nations which have got an enormous population but are not represented at all, i.e., India. So I got nowhere. I, the, if the people looked at turn and this is what this, I was a new minister, you know, what am I doing? The second meeting that I, I basically started saying, we got to do these kinds of things. And I got absolutely nowhere. That was fine. Except that about a year later, um, the Asian crisis occurred. Now the Asian crisis was a, a crisis involving uh, a, a lot of the smaller Asian countries, but also in, and involved people like Brazil, the devaluation of their currency, and and Russia that in fact had defaulted on a major piece of debt. So it was a it was a very big crisis, and so the, what the, the the G8 finance ministers we all got around the table, and we basically told basically told what the smaller Asian countries should do, um, and we sent off we sent off the notice to them. This is what you guys should do. And about a month later, we got a, a call that there was an emergency meeting of the finance ministers. Would we come back to the come back to the table? And we we got a note from these smaller uh, Asian countries, ba basically saying to stuff it. Who the heck do you think you are, uh, telling us what to do at a meeting to which we were not even invited? And so there was some consternation at the table, and then the, basically our meeting uh, broke up. On the way out, um, Larry Summers, who at that time was the treasurer, um, and I walked out together, and I said, look, Larry, I want to talk to you. Uh, and by this time, I'd learned a little bit, which is if you've got an idea, it's not a bad idea to talk to the Americans first. And so I, um, I said, let's go to your office. We, the meeting was being held in Washington. And I said to him, that idea that I had about the G20, I think that the time has come. This proves it. And he agreed immediately. So I said, okay, let's go back now. The other, uh, the, the others will still be probably walking around downstairs and let's get them and see if we can get it going. So we went back and we just called them one by one uh, and, and, and essentially said, look at this idea with the G20, it's time has come. And every single person, ex recognized what had just happened and they said yes it should so to, to, on that basis what we did is we then called another meeting of the g8 finance ministers had given our officials a chance to not put the whole work and we said let's call let's create the finance ministers g20 not the not in that global g20 we were the finance ministers but we could create our own finance ministers have had always a lot of in freedom to do the, these kinds of things and we did and I was made the first chairman, so I called the first uh, the first meeting. Was the chairman for three years, and essentially what we did is we started to lay down, <clears throat> and basically uh, lay down the answers to the issues that were really blocking us because we were only the G8 and we didn't have countries like Brazil, we didn't have countries like India, we didn't have a lot of the countries who were involved in these issues, and the G20. Um, uh, the G20 finance ministers was a, was a huge success. Then when I became prime minister, I sort of said, well, look, I'd like to get it. I want to get it to the, to the leaders level. 
And I spoke to the Chinese, got the Chinese on side, spoke to a lot of the countries. The one country that was a little reluctant was the United States. And I spoke to President Bush, but he, he didn't. He thought it was a lot of it's going to was going to fall on him. But I made a deal with him. And that is he he then said, but there'll be a crisis. And at that point, we can do it. And I said, I, we give me your word that if there is a crisis, you'll do it. And he said, yes. Uh, and he kept his word. Uh, in 2008, you may remember, there was a huge financial crisis globally. Um, and everybody was saying, what are they going to do? And uh, President Bush called the first G8 leaders, um, leaders meeting. And it was a huge success. And they dealt with a lot of the issues. I'll give you, just give you the one, one Brian. Which, which you and I have talked about, but, but, but essentially the natural thing to happen when you have that kind of a crisis would be protectionism. If they had done, if the, if the G8 had gone for protectionism um, or the G20 had gone for protectionism, we would have had a massive depression like they had in the 1930s. And so, but what happened is that they didn't and they, ba they basically hung together. Uh, and that really proved the benefit of the G20 at the leaders, at the leaders level. And um, the rest is history. Fascinating. Thank, thank you for sharing that with us. And, and, I, and I think personally that that story certainly gives us a window into the future of multilateralism and to the G20 specifically. And I have to say, as you were telling the story, one thing that popped into my mind as sort of just a point to make is how often it does take a crisis for sort of innovation or for more enhanced collaboration to happen. And then you literally, took the words out of my mouth to make that point when you said that President Bush actually said that that would be needed for him to, to sort of back the idea. So yeah. what, a, what a, an interesting uh, and important story to, to, to share. So thank you for that. I, I have to point out as well that it's incredible that you went from, you know, at the table as the minister of, of uh, hockey insights at the age of 10 to all the way to the, <laughs> to helping create the G20, the chair as the finance minister, so, so quite the story there for sure. Uh, I, I want to go into implementation now. So as I mentioned in my preamble to the, to the previous question, on paper, if you will, the G20 certainly uh, is well set up for all the reasons that you've mentioned to really help us tackle the global challenges that you listed off earlier. Um, so, so you sat around that table, obviously, you helped create it, you've, you've, you've worked with those uh, with world leaders, you've worked with finance ministers. So, so please tell us a little bit about what you think in terms of the G20's capacity to get things done, uh, its capacity to really take action, or if I was playing the cynic role and, and sort of maybe asking what the cynic would, would say if they were sitting here uh, from my basement in Shadag Bridge speaking to, to the former prime minister, um, is it just a bunch of platitudes? Is it just a bunch of lofty goals and a bunch of photo ops that people get together for these meetings? So, so if you could maybe speak a little bit about the action and the follow-up stemming from these multilateralism efforts, especially with the G20. Well, your, your question, Brian, is very well taken and it can demonstrate so you've got a profound understanding of, of where we are. And the G20, I think the G20 has been a success, but um, I, I, I think that when you look at, at, at some of these issues that we're facing, in this case, the, the pandemic, how the, we've done a fair, fairly good job, but there's no, we should have been more prepared for, for what, for what happened. And we were not, um, if you look at, if you look at climate change, it's been, you know, as there's, has been as much failure as there has been good movement and, and that kind of thing. So the point that you're making is, is well taken. The example I think that I would give as to what has, has to happen is the finance ministers um, at, at the level of the G8 and at the level of the G20 have been a huge success. The finance ministers have taken the steps that have, they've had to take. It. And one of the reasons for this is, um, A, the individual ministers, they're not, they're not the leaders. And so they don't have to worry about fancy communiques or anything else. What they can do is I've got to get the job done. Um, and, uh, and, and how do I, how do I do it? And so my own, and, and if you take a look at what the finance ministers have done, I mean, essentially they took a lot of that. They've taken a lot of indi individual actions. So I think what you really have to do is we have to empower other ministers, recognizing that governments are the ones that implement. 
you know, I mean, it's, it's important that you have things like COP26 talking about the, in, in, uh, the environment. It's what the United Nations does is tremendously important, but it's governments that take actions and it's ministers who, within their own area who push governments to take, to take actions. And I think that that's what we really got to do. So essentially what I, I, I think that has to happen throughout the G20 um, and I would think throughout, in fact, a much wider base is that we need environment ministers have got to become climate change ministers. In other words, environment ministers have simply got to take upon themselves the responsibility to, to make to make those arrangements that are going to make this this thing su succeed mm -hmm. um, in terms of health care. Um, the ministers of health have got to become the ministers who are responsible for essentially gearing up for unknown pandemics and and that's that is the way in which i would do it so that fundamentally what would happen is instead of health ministers or instead of um, uh, uh, climate change ministers or environment ministers paving the way for the leaders what the ministers have got to do is what finance ministers have done is take on the responsibility to, to, to deal with this within their countries and globally, and they'd have to be supported by their governments under those circumstances. And so that um, just to, to take, to, you know, to sort of to take one one example, um, let's just take uh, uh, take healthcare. We could, could I could have taken climate change on the same basis, but take you know take healthcare. The fact is, we you can't predict the next pandemic. But you sure as heck can be geared up for it, when, no matter what it is. Um, if you, if what you do is you take the lessons that we have learned from the current pandemic, um, and and I think that that's the first thing that has to happen. Which also means that you've got to go in there and you basically have got to close down wet markets, uh, where from from where a lot of this comes, and you have to essentially build up massive research capacity. Canada had a tremendous research facility in the Connet Labs at the University of Toronto, which played a huge role in, in the creation of the, the, the SOC vaccine and this kind of thing. But we don't have that kind of research capacity in Canada at the present time. And Canada as a country should basically be able to create research capacity that will make it an important uh, a contribution to how do you project the solutions to the next pandemic that's going to come so that when the next pandemic does come you've got a you've got a, a reaction set out as to how you deal with it you may have to adapt it but if what you're studying these things and these research capacities from country to country play a role then i think that you're going to do it and there is one other thing that i would would do to to this uh, to these the appointment of these ministers within the G20 is there has to be multilateral institutions created that themselves are going to focus on these, such as, as an example, there has to be um, the, the IMF, International Monetary Fund, mm -hmm. is the most powerful multilateral institution out there. And it is one of the reasons that the finance ministers have been so successful. Because if you're a finance minister and you're working on this, you can call on the uh, on the IMF. And the IMF doesn't get involved in elections, doesn't sort of lose it, doesn't have to get a headline. The IMF really is very tough body, but it's incredibly well financed and it does and, and it does it. Uh, so that's that's my, my view is that we have got to create these kind of institutions. There is no um, institution that focuses on climate change internationally. I mean, you, you know, you've got COP, uh, the, the, the COP meetings, they're, they're very important. The United Nations is very important, but they do a lot of studying. They don't take the tough decisions that have got it, that, that, are, that, are, that are taken. And so, and the only people who can take those tough decisions are governments. And the only people who can make the governments do it, apart from the leader, is the minister in charge of climate change, maybe the minister of the environment. And the same thing in the case of the minister of health. Now, the minister of health, and you and I have talked about this, Brian, um, you're going to have to appoint a body that's going to be the, the climate change body.
number one. Um, and, it, and you know, one, some people have suggested, and when I've raised this issue, that maybe it should be the IMF. It's a finance meeting, but it's a very, they're a very tough body and they got it and they could add to it. I'm, I'm not sure that's the answer, but I think it's certainly one worth, worth discussing. The other one is in terms of the, um, the, the WHO. And um, if, if you don't mind, I'm going to. Yeah, of course, please. The, 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 the WHO is by far the body best suited to carry out the world, the role that the IMF plays with the finance ministry. The problem is that it is, in, it, it is badly funded. Um, it, it doesn't make any sense, but it, it, it mo the most of its funding is voluntary. Most of its funding is not annually guaranteed, which means that the WHO cannot prepare for the future, cannot build up when something occurs it, over time, it's got to go you know, hustle money and raise money, and it just doesn't build it up. The WHO has got to get to have the same quality funding that the International Monetary Fund has. And the reason for this is the International Monetary Fund does this because uh, ha has this funding because everybody recognizes the economy has got global economy has got to be protected. But the fact of the matter, the matter is, surely to God. Global health is every bit as important as the global economy. And what's really important is to point out that global health is crucial to successful economies. The, the fact of the matter, take a look at the global economy today. Take a look at the level of deficits and all that's out there. Thank God, because governments spend it because they had this health problem. But the fact of the matter is, is that we don't want to have to go through another uh, 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 pandemic we want to be able to deal with that pandemic, and if we do, it's it's going to be it's going to take a lot of money, but it's going to be money that's going to be nowhere near what it took to be, to beat this pandemic. Everything that you have said in this webinar is powerful, it's thoughtful, so thank you. But I want to take a moment to underline to those listening, to, for us to take a, a moment and think about. The comments that you just made on how to make sure the G20 and other institutions can implement their mandates, and this is coming from someone who, yes, a former prime minister, but somebody who played a role in setting up the G20, somebody who sat at the table as a prime minister, as a finance minister, and, and that your recommendation based on all of that and much more in terms of experience and insight is that there is a need for bodies to be created for ministers to help implement the actions needed by various governments uh, by the G20, and as you mentioned, maybe even larger than that, to combat climate change, to combat pandemics uh, in the future, and, and and perhaps other global challenges. So I, I just I have to underline for all of us listening to take a step back and think about the perspective that you have when you make that recommendation. So so I think it's all that much more powerful. Um, so I just want to make a quick reminder to those listening: if you have questions, you can send them in, and I'll. À ceux et celles qui nous écoutent, s'il vous plaît, nous envoyez des questions si vous en avez. We'll try to get to as many questions as possible. Um, I have another one, though, uh, Mr. Martin, that I'd like to ask. It's, it's a bit more of an open-ended one, but I'm, I'm curious with, with everything that you've said, everything that you've been thinking about for this webinar, everything that you've experienced, are, are you optimistic about the future of multilateralism? Uh, are, are, are there reasons for us to, to uh, be optimistic as, as a collective that the global institutions are indeed going to be able to collaborate the the countries uh if not all of them but the ones that we definitely need to be collaborating to overcome some of these global challenges is that going to happen are you optimistic and if so maybe why yeah i am i am uh, um, i am optimistic um the the question is uh if you don't share the view that you've just expressed uh, uh, and that I have expressed. Um, it's because you don't really think the world's all that important and you you, you and your own little country uh, can solve whatever problems you can. can. Well, that's obviously not, not the case. Uh, what it really takes is, is an understanding to know that that geographic piece of property that your company has is part of a round ball called, the, called Earth. And that we we have to basically make sure that the earth the earth can survive. And what that really means is partnership. And you know, 
something's just hap something's happening right now that I really think gives me a lot of good feeling about that. And that's the Webb Space Program. You know that the it, it's, it, it, they just announced it, I think, yesterday, the Webb Sp Space Program is now, at now attained a level in space that, that they can actually take, take a look at what the world looked like almost at the time of the Big Bang. I mean, think about that, how far back they've gone. I mean, my God, I mean, that's even older than you and me, Brian. The, uh, and so, so what's happened is, and there's a, about 13 nations came together building the space. And there wasn't one nation, 13 came together, built the, um, the telescope, built the space program that can, build, can take it, and they, they've done it. My God, it's not just a question of they writing it down on a piece of paper and say, I wonder what it is. They've done it. They're up there. They're taking a pic they're taking pictures right now of of the um, of, of space and and uh, space and the stars working together to create the space that we now and the star star stars that we now know are what the world is all about. And we we are now going to be in a capacity. Um, up to a reasonable amount to take a look at the world being formed, the the the, the, the galaxies being formed. I mean that is enormous, and I don't think and, and to see that happen, I think it gives me on a positive thing like that gives me a lot of confidence. I think really is I think people are now prepared to understand how exciting it is to be. I'm very proud to be a Canadian. Um, or I'm very proud to be an American or a German or whatever it may be, but I also live in this planet, and I'm pretty proud of what this planet can do, and let's see what more we can do. That's what the space program says to me, and I think it's great. Well, you just made me a little more optimistic. Uh, it's incredible how we, when we find any group of individuals, and, and if you take the collective around the globe uh, as a group of individuals, when we think about external opportunities or challenges that's often when we come together so so space exploration and 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 discovery certainly is one way for us to sort of remind ourselves that we're that we're all one big group one collective uh the as you mentioned right off the top uh the idea that there are sort of wars against humanity such as climate change and pandemics is maybe uh, another way for us to have perspective that we're sort of all in the same boat uh rowing together um so so thank you for that I want to go and, and take a question from the crowd, if you're okay with that, Mr. Martin. Uh, and it's a good segue into uh, into what you just uh, chatted about. So, uh, he, and I'm, I'm reading off here, I would like to hear Mr. Martin's thoughts on the role of technology in foreign affairs. So essentially disinformation, the influencing of elections and democracy uh, via social media, and I'll add maybe other, other means as well, uh, data privacy, cybersecurity, AI, uh, all of these things that the war is essentially, or, or wars will essentially now become virtual. So any any thoughts on what, what that will have as an impact on foreign affairs? Well, it's obviously having a huge effect on foreign affairs. I think that certainly most of the people uh, uh, in my time um, in government, um, the capacity uh, of cyber to, to breach security cyber security problems and all of that were nowhere near as far developed as they are today um and and that is this is a very different world from that from the, from that point of view um i do believe that we are we we if we put our minds to it um and we do this idea that essentially and i think it's finance ministers and this one that should step in uh finance ministers essentially one of the first things that they did when the g20 finance ministers is they basically uh, created the Financial Stability Board, which which would took care of huge problems in terms of financing, and then they went after terrorist financing, and they were able to basically stop a lot of it. And I think that if if governments are serious about wanting to deal with this kind of thing, they're going they they are going to have to do it. To be quite honest, I think that the understanding of how you mess up cyber security, how you put it all together, I'm not sure it's my generation that's going to have the understanding because I don't think I do. But um, I, there's no doubt that, I, yes, I think we can deal with that. We have to deal with it. Uh, yeah, very interesting perspective to put into, uh, into, the, uh, into the, um, the, the discussion in terms of sort of the exponential way in which this is now a thing, right? This is now something that 
uh, is very much at the forefront of, of our efforts and, and thank you for giving us that perspective. Another question for you, uh, Mr. Martin, uh, and I know this is a subject that is that is near and dear to your heart. It certainly was while you were prime minister. So, so child care. Um, it, it seems certainly it, it, over the last few years, uh, I'm sure there'll be a, a, th there could be a debate in terms as to why that's the case. But nevertheless, put that aside for now. There seems to be more traction in advancing investments in child care in Canada. Uh, and and one thing that I'll submit is is a hypothesis is that I, that I have is that as as of late it feels as though um, stakeholders and thought leaders and probably even more importantly decision makers are starting to see that you don't have to, and you've alluded to this a while ago, you don't have to separate policy decisions into economic or social. And, and you made the point to say health and the economy are very interlinked. So, so a hypothesis I certainly have, and, and I think the Pearson Center, uh, not to speak on its behalf, but I think that they do share this hypothesis. I mean, these are, uh, policies that are intersected with uh, economic considerations, social considerations, at times environmental uh, considerations, and so forth. So all that to say, I know it's something that was very near and dear to your heart while you were prime minister and while you were in government. Uh, what, what have you been thinking over the last uh, few years as, as you've seen the childcare debate sort of unfold in Canada and, and certainly uh, advance, some would argue, quite significantly? <laughs> There are, there may well be decisions that deal with the economy that don't deal with social policy. And there are decisions that deal with social policy that don't deal with the economy. But they are very, they're very few and far between. Fundamentally, um, you know, if, if, if somebody 100 years ago or 200, 150 years ago had not said, you know, free elementary school, free primary school is the kind of thing we've got to do. You shouldn't have to pay to go to school. We're going to make sure that all of these people out there, these low class people can, uh, who were certainly my ancestors, uh, uh, we, we want them to be able to go to school. Without that, I wouldn't be here. And I would think that an awful lot of the people who are watching us wouldn't be, wouldn't be in a position to be doing that. Uh, so that and that certainly applies to child care. I mean, what, what you've got to do when you look at the costs of things is also look at the costs of not doing it. If you, I mean, essentially, if what child care means, children are going, to be, are, going to, are going to be ready for school, they're going to be taken care of far better, and it also means that an awful lot of women who can make a huge contribution to the, uh, uh, to the economy are going to be able to do, to do so. And uh, there's no doubt in my mind that a economic protect projection on the basis that we have child care or we don't have child care is night and day. And you can make that on a, you can make the decision in terms of child care um, on strict economic, strict economic grounds and, and it should be made. That being said, however, um, it go, and it goes back to our view of the world, surely to God, the decision doesn't have to be made on an economic basis. The economic basis prove, will prove it, but surely to God, the decision should be the moral decision that what we really want to do is to ensure that every single child has the opportunities that others have. Well, there, there you go. Very well said, and, and I think you more eloquently described the hypothesis I have, so thank you for, for doing that. Uh, Mr. Martin, no surprise, there are quite a few questions that I'm going to kind of mold into one here. No surprise, I think, given to anybody listening, uh, the, the legacy in which uh, you, you certainly have built up in terms of helping the country get through uh, some tough financial decisions, tough financial times. Uh, so I'm going to take all the questions, there's three or four of them just on this topic. Uh, if you were to provide advice to uh, governments around the world, could be governments, the provinces, the federal government, but could be could be all governments, uh, based on on of course the ramifications and consequences of the pandemic. What would you what would you say to the governments in terms of kind of the finances and and the fiscal situation of their respective governments moving forward, given the fact that we've just gone through a very tumultuous time uh, in, in many ways, uh, including an economic and financial way uh, with the pandemic. 
Well, I, I think that, and let's looking at our own country, I don't think there's any doubt the government made the right decisions in funding uh, our way through the pandemic the way that they did. Uh, if they had, I mean, we, we are looking at an economy, we are looking at, you know, a large levels of, of indebtedness, there's no doubt about that. Um, but we are looking at a way out of this. We're looking at it with hope, with hope because in fact the economy is coming back uh, um, and what massive damage that could even worse than what was suffered um, did not happen which means we're going to be able to survive this and we're going to be able to build on it so I think that I think that fundamentally the government has taken the right decisions it's going to take time um, but we've never had a pandemic coupled with a coupled with climate change of the extent that we just had. And naturally, you're going to have to pay for it and that we are going to have to pay for it. But I think the government has taken the right moves and what it has to do is to simply continue with more. This is not the time for great austerity. This is the time to make sure that the economy succeeds. Well, let's go to another important topic economically and financially speaking for for Canada um, on on the topic of protectionism, which you had which you had raised uh, a bit earlier. Our largest trading partner is spending billions to bring supply chains back home. Uh, obviously, quoting a quoting a question here, uh, and they are bringing in policies to favor local production. Uh, so, so on the idea of protectionism, uh, what, what what are your thoughts about Perhaps, well, the, the 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 attitude in general, I suppose, given that some are going through the financial and economic challenges of the pandemic, uh, and then also specifically for Canada, and maybe what it should be doing to try to ensure that uh, that free trade continue, or if you if you think that protectionism is what needs to happen here in the country as well. Well, I think that the 1930s depression. Uh, pretty well answers the question. The fact of the matter is that following the Second World War, um, uh, the First World War, I'm sorry, uh, following the First World War, um, essentially what the world got together, we, we introduced, they introduced a lot of protectionism. Um, there were a lot of problems, the reparations that were demanded and all of these, these kinds of things that they went through. And, uh, and they even, uh, uh, they, they even, canned the League of Nations, the, 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 the forerunner to the, to, the, um, to the working together of the, the, the League of Nations. And we had therefore ended up with the worst depression in human history. And if you really want to know what protectionism can lead to, that's what it can lead to. So I, I think that there's the, there and therein lies the answer. I mean, I don't have to, I don't think if we, we and I, I, I will say that on, if, if I might, uh, on the issue of, um, of electric automobiles, uh, mm -hmm. and I, I think that that it, that attitude of, of the United States is is really very disappointing, and it, it, it is not going to work. The fact of the matter is, I'm from Windsor, Ontario. I grew up in the automobile city, of, uh, 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 you know, of, of Canada, and there's there is no doubt that if you grew up, there were automobile plants. In Detroit, there were automobile plants in Windsor, and the whole thing worked, and everything knew what we were doing, and we were together. And that's the kind of confidence that you you you've got to build. And so, and that is a historic industry, and and histor historic way of approaching it. And to be quite honest, for the United States to come along and say, all of a sudden. Um, one of the things that has built North America is the automobile industry and the automobile industry in Detroit and in Windsor. Um, and we're going to call it, we're going to call it quits. Even, you know, we'll do, we, we'll just, we, we, maybe we'll call it quits, but to call it quits in the next generation of new kinds of automobiles, the electric, of uh, the electric automobile just essentially walks away not only does it walk walk away on the deal that I think we all thought we had in North America, but it walks away on what works, and it walks and, and walks walks away from the confidence that we can all have in each other. And in the end, I cannot believe that that's what's going to happen. 
Well, I, people aren't here to listen to me, that's for sure. But I'm going to add one point that I think is important as well. As we battle global challenges like climate change, there's tough decisions that are required. Now, many will argue that some of these tough decisions that might seem to have a, a, a negative impact on economies or on our finances can, can at the same time, though, on the sort of same coin, different sides, can have opportunities. And electric vehicles is probably an opportunity. It's an opportunity of innovation. I mean, there's going to be huge demand, uh, one would think, moving forward. So the idea that one country would say, no, we want to protect the opportunities and, and some of the good economic impacts of fighting climate change to ourselves, I think also is detrimental to the overall collective efforts to, to take on a, a global challenge. People aren't here to listen to me, but I, I just wanted to make that point because that's something that, as, as I would say, as we would say back home here in New Brunswick, I'm a tracasse. Uh, so I'm going to give you one no, more no, question. Just, 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 one, uh, just one second. I want to say something. The fact is that, that uh, what you have just said, um, you asked me a question and I, you answered it better than I did. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I think that you, you said it you could not have said it better. <laughs> You're very kind. That, that that makes my day, to say the least. Mr. Martin, we don't have a lot of time left. I know I know Andrew will probably come on soon to thank us, but I want to ask one more question, and it is it is a tough one, but it's it's I'm going to ask it in a vague way, only because there are there are three four questions that came in on on this type of topic, and I'm I'm putting them all together. So so it's about uh, essentially China and Russia. So the the idea being how how do we advance multilateralism uh, when there are and, and I say this, it's not the right word to use, but I'll just use challenges with regards to, to uh, Russia and China and collaboration. So, so what are your thoughts? What can be done? Uh, what does it mean for Canada? I mean, take, take with the little time that we have left, please take the, the question where you'd like. Well, it just simply means that multilateralism is going to be more difficult. Um, and, uh, but that doesn't mean that we give up. It means, it means that multilateralism um, and the working multilateralism makes so much sense. In the end, uh, I think that it's going to prevail. And all I'm saying is don't be discouraged and don't give up. Make it. There is no other answer. <laughs> fair, fair enough. Well, Mr. Martin, uh, I'm not sure if Andrew's going to join us or not, but we're, we're at that time. Uh, what, what a wonderful conversation from my perspective. I'm obviously very biased as I get to, to chat with you. Thank you immensely on behalf of everybody listening for, for your insights. And, and of course, another opportunity for us to thank you for your contributions to our country. Uh, what, what, a, what, what a perspective you have given us and, and you've been so generous with your time. And, and of course, over the years, so generous uh, in, in making a difference, uh, not only in Canada, but across the globe. Alors, merci beaucoup. Thank you. One last thing I might say to you, I might say to you, Brian, it, 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 we, I talked about the power of cabinet ministers and how they really got to take, a, take charge of everything else. Same thing for provincial premiers. Hey, there you go. I, I like it. That's a good way to end. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Brian. Uh, Mr. Prime Minister, thank you so much for sharing your time with us uh, today. And certainly in, in preparing for this session, you, you put a lot of time into it, as you did, Brian. Um, it, it, You've been known as a visionary, as a prime minister. Uh, thank you for today once again reminding us what you have meant to us through your many years of service in, in public office and as prime minister. Um, there are so many issues that face us today that it is incredibly important and useful for us to have the wisdom uh, that you shared with us today. So thank you so much. Well, let me just say, uh, Brian, the Pearson Center is very well known and I'm, I'm I'm flattered that the Pearson Center would have asked me to come and I'm delighted. I really enjoyed the discussion and I may I just I want to congratulate you for the Pearson Center. I mean, Mr. Pearson, you know, as I mentioned to, to Mika, it was a great prime minister. You have taken his name. You have honored his name. And as a as a progressive organization, you really you are you are a real gift to Canada. So thank you. You're very kind, sir. Thanks. Thank you for that. I'll share that with our board and, and members. I, I just want to remind our audience that the next webinar we have uh, flows from today. A lot of the discussion we've had today with the pollster uh, Michael Adams, who will be talking about the changing political culture in Canada and the United States. And in April, we have our, our annual conference. And during that, we will have a session with members of the Pearson family to talk about uh, Lester Pearson 
uh, both his record and and his role as a family man. Um, and we'll we'll further the discussion that that you so kindly um, started today. Thank you, Mr. Martin, for 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 your time, but also for mentioning the the importance of uh, Lester B. Pearson to our country. Thank you. All that concludes our event. Thank you.